Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 710th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe Stagaman, the Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Gerard and Kelly and Charles Chaffayet. We're thrilled to welcome poet Violet Spurlock here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. And here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for actual, necessary, decolonial work, but a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land that we are speaking from. And it's my pleasure today to introduce our guests and host. Brennan Gerard and Ryan Kelly were both Van Leer Fellows at the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program and later each received an interdisciplinary studio MFA at UCLA. Gerard and Kelly began collaborating in 2003 and employ multiple disciplines, performance, video, and installation to examine questions of collective and individual memory, gender and sexuality, queer subjectivity, and the relationship between dance and visual art. Editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail, Charles Chaffee's writing on theater, visual art, literature, film, and music has appeared in numerous international publications, including The New Yorker, Art Forum, and others. Originally from Montana and now based in New York City, he writes regularly on opera for Opera News and on architecture and design for Harvard Design Magazine. His essays have also appeared in multiple books. With the Brooklyn Public Library, he co-curates Lit Film, an annual film festival focused on writers. And with that, it's my pleasure to pass it over to Charles. Thank you so much and uh, welcome everybody to what I'm sure was going to be a wonderful conversation because of uh, the guests that I'm speaking to today. Uh, I thought we would start just to give an introduction to the work of uh, Brennan and Ryan with a teaser of their film Panorama, which is currently at Marion Goodman Gallery in New York right now, and to give a sense of of what we might what we're going to be talking about and we can go from there i think the sound may be cool Thank you, Chloe. Uh, so maybe just start if you guys could explain uh, a little bit of the context of Panorama, and then we could go into the the nitty gritty of it. But you know what people just saw, and, and a little bit of the context of where it is, and why you're having uh, dancers perform in that space. Maybe great. Sure. Thank you, Charles. And just before answering, I just want to say it's such an honor to be here, hosted by the Brooklyn Rail. Um, we live in Paris now, but the Brooklyn Rail is still a resource, and it was one of the best things about New York when we lived there and worked there. <laughs> um, so it's a real honor. Um, and I guess, okay, so Panorama, yeah, we shot Panorama um, in 2020, 2020 actually, 
um, at the beginning of what was like called the second confinement here. So the second quarantine in France. Um, and it was shot at the Bourse de Commerce, which is um, a building of a long history in the middle of Paris. Um, it was the most recent kind of like big renovation was was prior to the to the to the most recent one was in the 19th century. And today the Bourse de Commerce is the home of the Pinot Collection, which is a contemporary art museum uh, founded by Francois Pinot. Um, we so we so we shot the film after the renovation, which had been complete um, by by Tadao Ando, the contemporary you know Japanese architect. Um, had constructed basically this kind of concrete cylinder rotunda in the middle of the the bourse, um, and uh, the renovation was complete. But the building, the none of no the art no artworks had yet been installed, and the building had to, we the museum had to postpone its opening by another. You know, we didn't know at the time, but it would be months. Um, because of the COVID crisis. So we had this unique opportunity to shoot when the building was in a pristine condition, renovation was complete, no artworks were there. And we we had a shoot when, you know, no, no public could be there. So it was a really kind of like amazing access that we had. And it's maybe to continue just a little bit of the background to give viewers a sense of your work that this is not the first time that you've uh, staged performances in uh, iconic venues, uh, in this case, not a home, but maybe if we could talk just a little bit and then we'll talk later in more detail, but that this is uh, continue. You do put this in, in modern living, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. yeah. You, uh, you have a large extended body of work, an ongoing body of work called Modern Living, which uh, if you could just explain a little bit about. Sure. And yeah. I'm I'm Ryan Kelly. This is Brennan Gerard. Normally we sit the other way. I realize <laughs> so that the Gerard and Kelly makes sense on the screen. Um, so yes, Panorama is the most recently presented um, film in our ongoing series, Modern Living, which we started in 2016. It's a series of performances and films that are set in that take place in and engage with. Uh, modernist architecture, sites of modernist architecture. Um, up until this point um, in the series, our performances and films have been set in domestic spaces. So Panorama with the Bourse de Commerce and the Tadao Ando intervention is the first civic architecture that we're engaging with in the project. Um, but what continues um, throughout is an, an interest and an engagement with the kind of obscured or lost or effaced histories um, um, that, that these spaces uh, once contained. Um, we're specifically thinking about kind of lost queer histories and in, in very improbable, let's say improbable sites for looking for um, uh, uh, queer relationality or the potential for it. Um, uh, so, so yeah, this is this film. And then I think later on, we might touch on the film that followed Panorama, um, which is called Bright Hours and is also part of this ongoing series. And then proceeding that to give just a little bit more context that uh, it's the Schindler House in Los Angeles, uh, the Glass House in New Canaan. Is that correct? That's right. New Canaan. And um, yeah. the Farnsworth House in Plano, Illinois. Um, and then we we worked on the Villa Savoie just outside of Paris uh, in 2019. Uh, and then Panorama and the Bourse de Commerce, and then Bright Hours, and Le Corbusier's Cité Radios. Um, and we're in the beginnings of preparations for a new chapter, um, which will take place at Eileen Gray's Villa E1027 in the south of France, which maybe we'll touch on as well. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, this 20 minute or thereabouts film, uh, it's a propulsive, kind of uh, dreamlike in many aspects, joyous and humorous and also nightmarish at other times. Uh, but I think that one thing which, as you've already touched on a bit, Ryan, that we might talk about to start the conversation is 
going to, in, in this case in particular, I think, uh, some of the most unlikely of sites to engage with queer subjectivities, queer potentialities, optimistic utopic ideas for the future, uh, that in particular this artwork, which has been retained in the Bourse, is something steeped in barbaric uh, colonial history. And so maybe if you could, again, sorry to just keep asking yeah. you to describe things, but to then uh, after, you know, describe the panorama painting a little bit, but then why it is that that interested you as, as a work, not that many people, uh, uh, as a work that unlike many people today would probably wish had been effaced, uh, right. you instead are activating it in a very different aspect. Yeah. It's a great I'm, question. I mean, I think that there's, in, in many ways, I think that this, uh, it also goes back to our first encounter with the architecture. Um, and oftentimes in throughout this project, the Modern Living Project, our very first encounters, embodied encounters with the spaces are really like what kind of lead us to a lot of the decisions that are made in the film um, or, or in the performances. So this was a film and we knew it was going to be a film. We visited the site. We knew about Ando's architecture. We had seen models. There was an exhibition, a retrospective of Ando's work at the Pompidou several years ago. And so we were kind of prepared for what Ando would do. And we had no, we had studied his architecture and been in spaces that had been designed by him. But the but atop the, the cylinder, there was a you know a, a, a frieze a painting that ran the entire um, 360 degrees underneath the glass dome. And this painting, which we were not prepared for when we visited the site, and we were visiting the site while it was still in renovation, so we had hard hats on, and um, oh yeah, this is a great image to see, was a depiction of France, um, France's commercial and colonial power at the end of the 19th century. Um, there was a particular panel, which you can see in the image that is on the slideshow now, which is also in the film, um, which represents America. Um, and uh, the the painting itself is full of um, colonial and race racist stereotypes, um, depictions of power that are very kind of monolithic and, and what you would expect from maybe a 19th century uh, painting, academic painting. Um, and then we, there was really kind of no context for this on our first visit. And so we really felt like we were both um, kind of in awe of, I think, Ando's architecture and his brutal poetics of this architecture, this gesture of a huge concrete cylinder in the middle of the space. And then we were very troubled by the representation that was in this painting. Um, and we knew we had to make something that um, interrogated not only the content of this painting, but how it, it formally works within the architecture of this space. Yeah, and I guess I would add to that, to your second part of the question, Charles, about um, why go looking in this um, cliched, stereotypical, racist, colonialist, also like kind of kitschy, not very well done academic painting of 1889 <laughs> um, for, as you say, a kind of uh, queer potentiality, right? Or, or I might say queer relationality. Uh -huh. um, aren't there better places to go in Paris? <laughs> <laughs> queer intimacy. Um, I think that the actually what comes to my mind in reflecting on your question right now is actually something that we gleaned from one of our graduate students at the GSD when we were working with the young architects there earlier in the year. Her name's Elsa Maki. We actually have gone on to collaborate together on a project for our show in Nîmes. And Elsa is working, um, her architecture project is working on toxicity and how to um, basically rehabilitate spaces without removing the toxicity from uh, like, I think about asbestos or other kinds of toxic, toxic chemicals that have accrued. Architectures 
typical like uh, hegemonic way of handling it presently is to just move it elsewhere and then build on on um on naked land so to speak but that elsewhere as we no longer exists. you know no longer exists the toxicity just keeps piling down river so to speak yeah. mm -hmm. so I, I i use that as a kind of metaphor i I've been very inspired by that idea, Elsa's idea of we have to learn to live with toxicity, which I think is a kind of alternative way of thinking about cancellation or removal or burying um, or forgetting or, or, or effacement. Yes, forgetting. Um, but I so I think what what we're, we're trying to do is say, I mean, that picture is not going anywhere. Actually, it's just been restored by the powers that be so it's definitely not going anywhere um so rather than just leave it there um and not speak about it we wanted to engage with it and see what potential might exist and of course you know we're shouting at it we're yelling back at it we're parodying it it's not we're doing everything it is not a celebration of this um these representations or this painting but it's an attempt and I think this is very much in the long legacy of queer aesthetics to use it almost like a bad B movie, you know, so <laughs> to kind of like find a way of living alongside it. I mean, it's certainly a dialogue uh, with one side, in your case, speaking a lot louder <laughs> and more uh, energetically than the painting itself. But I mean, one thing which I didn't know about until reading the catalog for the exhibition in Nîmes, which we will talk about next, was about the, uh, that there are five painters of the, of the painting, uh, even though it looks seamless. And also only one of the painters is etched in stone implying that there's only one painter, that there is a multiplicity and a brokenness to that work inherent to its creation. And yes. the idea of multiplicity is something that you're very interested in, uh, I know. And when I mean, you have three characters there, maybe uh, introduce who those characters are because that's not obvious in the, in the trailer, but this idea of the foolishness of believing in any sort of wholeness or any sort of fixed identity in the case of maybe talking about this painting uh, and this building, how the painting itself is, it, it manifests it, it, uh, that the, within the painting itself is a rejection of that wholeness, basically. Yeah, I think that that's so, I mean, I think you're you're picking up on something that that um, definitely Miwan Kwan writes about in that catalog essay. Um, for 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 the show Anim for Ruins, and absolutely that the in the research you discover that the of course that the history is a lot more complex than you think. Um, it is already this kind of collage. You can think of it as a collage. It is not a mural. It's not a mural. It's not a fresco. It was painted in studios and then applied by a team of painters. Um, the other thing that you that we started to realize it was painted at the same time for the same world's exhibition that the Eiffel Tower was first revealed. Mm. So you think about um, you know so-called artistic process progress. You have the Eiffel Tower, which is you know pretty much like uh, abstraction, right, <laughs> of of innovative material of the time, and then you still have this. And then if you also realize that at the time Monet was already painting. Um, the good water lilies yeah water lilies so it's 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 really is you start to realize it really is an academic painting it already has a historicist quality mm -hmm. to it right um and um it is definitely also an allegorical painting um in which the figures are not figures they represent everyone is representing someone right and what they tend to represent are in addition to being like stereotypes but like figures in which the, the 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 relation of domination is very clear and the relation is one of between people is one structured by violence and i think that we were very interested in working with a group of people um in which their relations were structured not by violence but by a kind of like shared engagement by um political solidarity by pleasure by transmission of knowledge and technique um, by a multiplicity of um, of responses. Um, and so I think that 
that I think that that was like our first move, um, but also insisting upon uh, a model of subjectivity and maybe a model of identity that 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 was multiple, and against the idea that was kind of translated by this by this by this by transmitted by this painting that identities are fixed and stable and in fact that that project the colonial project depends upon fixed and stable identities well does not allow multiplicity um and maybe i'll just say one other thing that like that part of the work is i think somebody said in the in the comments a real interrogation i think that's really what the film is it's a kind of continual questioning but it's also a questioning of its place within the architecture because it frames the architecture. So I think that's also a move that we were trying to do in the film is to not go to the center of the architecture, but to its framing device. Mm. So the painting is the framing device for this empty um, center, but it assumes that center of course is never empty. It assumes a center who that center is, is you know a white male, heteros heteronormative, with a certain amount of capital, who's who's very seldom represented in the painting, but that's the assumed center viewer for this painting. So we really wanted to also thinking about and who we worked with to kind of work not from the center but from the from the margins, um, speaking back to the center, if that makes any sense. So like we're taking this marginal set marginal place speaking from its margins back to this empty center and making that center multiple and no longer empty, but flooded with relations. And it's, a, I, mean, I think Ando's intervention heightens the emptiness that is asking to be filled in that space in particular. Uh, I mean, I never was in the space before the intervention, but I have been in the space since. And yeah. it does, it calls out its emptiness more than probably I'm, I'm assuming it did prior to the concrete being uh implanted there would you say so i oh absolutely i'm thinking about this moment in the film where this still comes from is when our three characters who are memory allegory and avenir or future they chant together this is actually they meet in the empty rotunda in the center and they chant um I am an empty house. Oh, wait, I, I, I have to translate it while yeah. <laughs> I do it, but I am an empty house, a yeah. house with no interior. I am a surface who has the right to be multiple. And I think there's something about that emptiness which seems very um, um how can I say this? Um perhaps. A, I'm going to say, I think it's a, perhaps a radical assertion because I think we live in a time that we're constantly flooding um, with representation um, and to make the argument that the political project might exist in the negative space. Mm. Um, I, do, I do think that's a radical proposition. I think the idea that the subject is null, null that it doesn't <laughs> exist, that we are structured through history and language and our encounters with others um has yet again become a radical proposition in a time from the right and the left when there are plenty of arguments um that kind of calcify the subject in almost cartesian ways as single um fixed identities i just saw Pos some oh, am i interrupting you sorry i said positives ah like I a just positive <laughs> I just saw in the comments uh, somebody say a word which actually I've written down in one of my questions, but in uh, looking at it differently. So maybe I'll pose it as a question um, that uh, I do, the, the word exorcism came up in the chat. And I was thinking of your pieces not as exorcisms, but as a kind of re inhabiting or revealing what was already there, but not to cleanse it, the, the kind of there's an impossibility of cleansing I think which you've already touched on of of living with the toxicity uh regarding that uh GSD students work or I mean how do you see that word uh, exorcism versus dealing with uh what's there in a new way I don't know if you want to touch on that at all well, the word we used was dis uh disinternment or mm. excavation 
yeah. yeah. I think there's an archaeological um, work at play. And I think that notion of archaeology, you know, it's not, it's not new. I mean, this is a very Foucauldian idea. You know, I'm thinking about Michel Foucault and like that part of the process of, of resistance and maybe liberation is an archaeology of knowledge that has been accrued over time. And that by revealing the sources of the discourse, you can start to use them for more liberatory, mm. powerful ways. I think that that's part of what, what is going on. And I will just add to what Ryan is saying is that the ideas of multiplicity and emptiness it, or or kind of uh, void at the center of subjectivity that are, that is in 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 the words of the of the film, but also in the choreography of the film, I would say too, is I think that one of the reflexes that one could have when you're faced with this troubling representation is to fall back on positive essentialized representations as a response, right? And I think that that model of essentialized identity is always a trap, right? Especially for the marginalized, marginalized from power. Um, and I think that we wanted to claim a power um, that did not fall into those traps, I would say. Um, to claim a, 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 a power among the people who are who are represented in the film and, and that, um, that, it, that their identities are multiple and can never be reduced to an image and also are relational and, and kind of imminent and becoming in the moment. Of of what we're watching them do, if that makes sense. We could keep going down this route, uh, uh, as I had said before we started the call. I think we should, just to shift to a different topic a little bit, and then move on to the show at Neem, which is called Ruin Ruins, uh, which I think uh, ties into everything we're just discussing. And I mean, one thing which I think that you guys are in some ways are archaeologists of the twentieth and twenty first century, uh, mm -hmm. and that as a counterintuitive notion to, to many people, I think. Um, but, but but stepping back from that, and I think the images that we're looking at tie into this a little bit, but I think before we go any further, it might just be worth uh, discussing what it is that having bodies in the spaces that you're uh, investigating and throughout modern living, how it makes a difference that you are doing staging performances, in this case, only a film and panorama, but at the Schindler House and, and the Glass House, live performances as well, what a body in those spaces can do mm. as opposed to an essay, a painting, uh, a yeah. film for that matter. You know, what is it that, and especially a live performance engaging with the public in that, in in the case of, of some of your other work. Mm -hmm. What what does the body make legible? Maybe I'll, I'll phrase it in a different way. What does the body make legible in the space that otherwise might be illegible uh, otherwise? I mean, I think, I think I, what, you know, I think the way I'll answer that is to say, um, we made very specific choices for the three performers in Panorama, um, German Louvet, Guillaume Diop, and Soa de Muse. And um, I'll, I can speak a bit about them, but um, we off, we always make very specific choices. So I think the idea of having, I'll maybe say it as someone in the space, uh, embodied and subjectified, mm -hmm. subjectivized, pardon, um, is a way of kind of intervening maybe in the idea of like, um, like the official history or the, or the hegemonic history um, by introducing a, a singular perspective right, which is absolutely impacted by those larger narratives. So as, uh, it, is, it is an embodied practice because we're talking about people who are moving, singing, chanting, um, uh, relating to the, you know, phenomenologically and physically to being in a space. But I think one thing that I, I would point out is we're always looking for that kind of double sense mm -hmm. of like it's there's a character but there's also a performer a person who's performing and i think this is i i want to kind of maybe carve that as something distinct from other 
um, other, let's say, practices that engage with dance, that have engaged with dance in architecture. You know, I can remember in our earlier discussion, we touched on the lives of performers, Yvonne Rayner, and how impactful that film was. Like, for us, it's the presence of that performer embodied and subjectivized mm. their memories, their reflections, that I think starts to do the real work of challenging even the iconic stature yeah. of some of these architectural spaces. Um, it's a little bit, you know, David and Goliath, because you, you, know, you have this like massive, historicized, well-narrated space like Philip Johnson's Glass House. And then here comes, you know, a, a person inside of it. So I think there's something there that is necessary for, um, yeah, even undermining some of the grandeur of these architectural monuments so that we can think about them again. Yeah, I mean, and then I would, I would also say that, especially in the performances, I think that that form of embodiment is not just enacted by the performers, but also the spectators. And I think that one of the things we've learned from doing this project is the necessity of being in a space, that these are spaces created for bodies. And I think that there's something that's happened, you know, in technology, but also in the field of architecture, where architecture has become an image, most likely a digital image. And most of the time you experience these spaces from their mediation. And so there's something about being there and realizing the effect, you know, sensorily and through time spent, because I think the body is also just another way of saying time mm -hmm. as, a, as, as an ephemeral materiality, the body, it is kind of speaking time in a way that, you know, also makes the whole architecture reminds us that the whole architecture is itself an ephemeral materiality, you know, nothing lasts forever. Um, so I think it kind of calls us back to that and makes our material investigation even further uh, heightened. That, I think, is a good uh, avenue to go toward Neem, which we, if, we, if Chloe could pull up the image of the space that the museum occupies or the, the gallery occupies, uh, which is a very unique uh, uh, dialectic uh, between these two, uh, the Norman Foster building and the 2000 year old Roman temple uh, that as, as we talked about the other day that everyone will have seen the Roman temple before coming into the exhibition space. And so how, uh, this is a bit of a broad question, but how might you say that this site itself kind of exemplifies, I think, your entire practice and, you know, particularly regarding this architectural landscape. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to minimize the strangeness of this view when you experience it with your own eyes. It did not ever, I never got accustomed to it because you're really staring at the 2000 years of you know, what we've come to understand as Occidental history, and, uh, you know, all the aspirations um, of, this, of, of what we call the West, right? And with its apotheosis <laughs> in <clears throat> modernism. Um, and Norman Foster, of course, is very consciously relaying the uh, Maison Carré um which it faces um and i think we couldn't really get away from this view like the whole exhibition at neem which is a survey of roughly eight years of work um preceding the modern living project and then through it um we just couldn't get away from this view like it, it and, and it it really underscored um the exhibition and how we were thinking about it. And we started to think about the exhibition as a kind of ex site of excavation. Um, and ultimately we finally do excavate the floor of the museum itself. Um, 
And I think I think partly my my staggering response is also due to my ambivalence um, about the modernist project as the apotheosis of the yeah. Occidental one, right? Um, which is to say, there are aspects I'm very attached to and aspects that require considerable critique. So we are looking here at an installation that we made for the exhibition. It's the kind of um, it's the last room of last the room. exhibition. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to speak to it? Yeah. I mean, well, I would just say before yeah. um, to the to go back to that image of the uh, the Karidar and the the Maison Carré, the the thousand year old temple right in front, is I think that was kind of riffing off what Ryan was saying is that. There was also a kind of giddiness at this view for for us, I think, is because the world is already postmodern. Yeah, <laughs> like sure. we are. Yeah. The condition is postmodern, postmodernity. So I think that, I think that that's coming. Also, it's not. I think it's also being artist. I think it's like engaging with these his, these modern spaces. I think it was really important for us to claim the postmodern as a place of possibility, you know. Um, and as, as like the world is already such, so let's use this as a basis and go from there. You know, we are in yeah. a postmodern world. Um, yeah. This idea that time is just to uh, add a little bit about time, and then maybe we could talk about the the Virginia Slim's uh, constructed work. That you know, this already this site is a is an exemplary uh, instance of of queer time in some ways that there's already a complete erasure of the idea of linearity. These two sites exist simultaneously with each other, whether you destroyed the building or not, you can't erase that. But this idea of, of queer time and times interwoven on, uh, and and we, we talked about this once before, the kind of erotics of time through uh, your performances and the you know uh, activation of these spaces once again, that I think this site serendipitously uh, enacts that what what you're perpetually rejecting of of a kind of heteronormative linear idea of of time. Uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about that before describing just, the Virginia Slim piece, but I can like respond that. anecdotally and say to your earlier question about what can a body do in a space like this. Oh, um, now I wish we had a picture, but so many times were we in the museum looking back at what would be the side of the Maison Carré. And you would see someone just like literally just like perched under a column eating a sandwich, you know, <laughs> and the kind of like quotidian use of the Roman ruin, like it's not protected. It's not like it's roped off. I mean, people just climb all over it and and, you know, do all kinds of things on the Roman ruin. And so that erotics of living with um, a, ruin. a ruin living with you know what does it mean every day you look and and you know also this is the symbol of the of the colonization of Nîmes right this was the kind of like imperial power of Rome constructing an impressive um, architectural monument also to to kind to to colonize mm -hmm. to make the people Roman the colony of Nîmes yeah um, so it's also a history of imperial conquest. Um, so there's deep ambivalence um, when looking and living beside this. So maybe now is a good time to explain the uh, the context of the. Uh, yeah, know, totally, uh, totally. Yeah, yeah. The, it's called Ten Thousand Recollections. Uh, is the name of the installation that we made um, for Neem, uh, for the museum, for this exhibition. Um, and it came because we were, you know, that initial view there, the Maison Carré, for which the museum, the Carré d'Art, is named and designed. Um, and our own practice of site specificity and engagement with architecture, kind of truly in the building of the exhibition, once we got through, the rest of the show, we were like, okay, I think we have time to respond now. To well, we also felt we had to make a site specific uh, yeah. work inside of a show that was about other sites, you know. Right. So, like the show being the non site, and there was tons of other sites that we had remade specific responses to. So, we felt we needed to do something here and now in this place 
where you are yeah. that kind of brought you back reflexively to where you're standing. So what we were, and th this is a project that we made in collaboration with the um, graduate student at Harvard GSD I mentioned before, Elsa Maki. Um, and we were inspired because we um, had, you know, we were reading about the Maison Carré and what is it? And we discovered that uh, Thomas Jefferson, when he was a diplomat, an ambassador from the US to France in the late 18th century, um, fell in love with the Carré d'Art because it is... With the Maison Carré. Sorry. <laughs> Carré d'Art was not yet open. <laughs> with the Maison Carré. <laughs> <laughs> queer time queer yeah. time <laughs> um because it, it it is and was then and continues to be one of the best preserved uh roman ruins and so um at this moment uh uh jefferson was was living in france he was um and he was missioned to design an architecture what would be the first civic architecture in the newly formed United States, and it would be the state capital of Virginia. In Richmond. In Richmond. And we and what Jefferson did, what we learned was that he he made he commissioned a French architect to design a replica, a model of the um carré of the Maison Carré, and to send that to Virginia which would then be used for the design of the Virginia State Capitol. Because Jefferson believed that the builders in Virginia, far from the uh, roots of European uh, culture and Greco-Roman classicism, would have, uh, and mixed as they were with indigenous and African populations in the newly formed Republic, would be um would not would not be able to build something of beauty of classical beauty of classical beauty and well, proportions saying, yeah right and so and this this story that ryan is telling in the installation itself as you can see here the plaques on the wall there are 15 plaques on the wall that are our kind of version of what this history is um Right. So Jefferson does build the state house in Virginia, designs and builds the state house because in addition to being a president and an inventor and all those things, he was also an architect, right? Mm -hmm. um, so he was the architect of this building. It was built. Um, and at the time, uh, the main cash crop of Virginia was tobacco and actually cultivated um through a system of enslaved labor through the chattel slavery system that was you know the system of 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 capital in in America especially in Virginia at the time um later the 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 Virginia state capital during the at the beginning of the civil war became the seat of the confederacy so this this um architecture was that was meant to project the ideals of the enlightenment and kind of like classical democracy became the seat of the slaveholding south for the years of the civil war um so in the installation where um we we chose to build the model out of virginia slim's cigarettes um contemporary cigarettes from virginia slim's which were actually and the cigarettes themselves are functioning as the columns of, of the architecture. Um, and we chose to install this on one of the tables that is actually part of the museum, for part of the exhibition design. Other parts, there's, these tables are found throughout the other, other, other galleries in the exhibition. Um, but they're kind of shown over displaced, the displaced marble floor tiles of the museum, which then uh, exposes the kind of uh, the what's underneath these tiles, which uh, included some like cigarette butts, apparently from when they built the building <laughs> um, that were still there. Uh, and then those those tiles are just placed onto the wall into a column at the same in the same space where the plaques are installed that tell this um, kind of intertwined story. I mean, this also again touches on an idea of toxicity in the sense of cigarettes, uh, and 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 living with that toxicity by by acknowledging it, it as part of uh, the past, and also I'm thinking about it even more that that there's a 
fragility to this in counterpoint to the stone. I mean, if you take a match to this, it won't, won't go up so quickly, but nevertheless, it'll go up. It's designed to burn uh, in the case of the cigarettes. And uh, you know how, and just another thought that, uh, thinking back to Jefferson, that, you know, there was a strangeness of neoclassical architecture in early America that we don't even think about. I mean, what's the point of putting something like this in Virginia in the uh, late 18th century when the rest of America does not look neoclassical? Uh, and so that just ties in again to this kind of ways in which you're exposing a kind of inherent strangeness that we've we've become blinded to, I would say. Um, I would even, yes. I, what, what, what's kind of revealed in the parkour of the, of the, um, the 12, 12 or so 15 plaques, I guess. Oh yeah, there's the lighter waiting for <laughs> exactly that action you were describing, Charles. Hmm. Should anyone care to pick up the glass? Um, it's a different kind of uh, art, a performance piece that, that yeah. you're going to play. Indeed. But um, the other element that we discovered um, when researching Jefferson and the Maison Carré is that he wrote and published his only book during his lifetime while he was here in France um, at this same time that he had been commissioned to design the Virginia State Capitol. And that book is called Notes on the State of Virginia, which is a response to some 2025 imagined queries from a European interlocutor asking Jefferson what, you know, about the state of Virginia, its flora, its fauna, its economies, its, and ultimately um, Jefferson in query 14 launches into a unabashed um, racist and white supremacist explanation and essentialist explanation of the differences between white people and black people and indigenous people. Um, we did include a scrap um, torn from these pages in one of the plaques and felt it was important to reveal because this is at the base of the whole project for Jefferson, meaning um, it's, it is his his fear that white Americans, this beginning of this construction of a group, um, are so far literally geographically from Europe that if they don't have the architecture to remind them of their European root, their Greco-Roman antiquity, this perceived white, which of course mm -hmm. it's not at all white, but perceived white history, then they would <clears throat> they would become barbarians. Barbarians. That's exactly what he says. Mm -hmm. If they're not civilized, they'll become barbarians. And it was, I have to say, I mean, it's not that any of us thought, you know, Jefferson a saint, but it was really shocking to read his actual verbatim words in Notes on the State of Virginia. Mm -hmm. And I would, I should also say that to this research, we were really indebted to the work of Mabel O. Wilson, who is an architect and architectural historian at, at Columbia. Um, and um, she has done an amazing series of work, but did specific research around Jefferson's architecture um, and the, the role of race within that architecture. For the to, go to, mm -hmm. oh, to go to that Benjamin quote, basically, you know, the idea that Jefferson believed that uh, uh, it would turn Americans into uh, barbarians. It's the act itself that uh, makes them barbarians. I mean, they, the, the barbarianism has, to, to paraphrase Benjamin, comes in the act of what Jefferson was attempting to do rather than the other way around. Um, but, Absolutely. And oh, I, think in, I think in Benjamin, I think that, that this research is obviously coming out of the experience of working on Panorama, the film, and thinking about you know the colonial project as the extension of the Enlightenment project and how barbarianism is buried in that you know constitutive of, of it, and then when we were rereading Benjamin while we were making this, we were like, we finally I think it was the first time 
from reading that piece of Benjamin's that I really understood what he meant by this quote. There is no document of civilization which is not at the same time a document of barbarism. I think it was finally made sense to me, but I think it was definitely growing out of the work that we were, the archeology span that we were working on in Panorama. At the risk of ending this discussion, uh, but I see the time and we don't have a lot more time. I thought maybe we could shift to another aspect of the Neem show, which I think is is particularly uh, maybe opaque to a lot of people, myself included. Uh, and I thought that this you have some pieces there which are, and push against these words, translations, transmissions of the performance work into sculpture, into notation, into drawing. Uh, you see these screens here. Uh, if you could talk a little bit about these screens and and talk about this is a this is a maybe a discussion about permanence and impermanence to tie it into everything else we've been talking about um, and transmission and legacy of an ephemeral act into uh, a material artwork in this case. Yeah, it was so nice to see those screens again because we hadn't seen them in some years. Um, they, they're well. They're called. It's a three three works that um, are called the family is a system of regeneration, one, two, and three. Um, they are made out of the same materials and dimensions as this particular architectural fragment from the Schindler House. And in the performances at the Schindler House and in the film Schindler Glass that we made after those performances, at one point, the group of dancers assembled make a kind of chant, uh, the family is a system of regeneration. <gasps> the family is a system of regeneration. <gasps> and we were interested in that, when we're interested in that, piece of text, which is very um, present in the performance and in the film. Um, but also then you have the, the, the kind of diagrammatic painting that moves across um, the nine panels, um, which from the top of the diamond to one, one top to the other top is marks the kind of 60 minutes of the performance cycle in which each of the nine performers is attributed a color, um, a color which they wear in, in the performances and in, in the film. Um, and the kind of um, um, kind of top and bottom halves of the diamond um, split the site into the Schindler and the Chase sides of the house. The house um, was built for two couples living in a kind of commune in the 20s in West Hollywood, what became West Hollywood. And so what these diagrammatic forms are doing is basically telling you, mapping the position on one side of the house or the other, and the relation among dancers at each minute of the performance cycle from zero to 60. And then it loops and repeats, and one could say it continues to regenerate. Um, in a kind of double helix like form. How might you say, and I think maybe something in the catalog touches on this, but about faithfulness in terms of transmission, translation of the performance that I think uh, maybe it's the essay that discusses how there's often a misconception of faithfulness in terms of translation in relation to dance uh maybe in particular that a film of your performance in the glass or the Schindler house which is also a meme uh maybe take it how, how, how you might uh a, a different kind of uh faithfulness to the act whereas this is this more faithful less faithful faithful in a different sense i just you take that as you will and I, I think we're pretty inf infidel. I don't think we're too interested in faithfulness. Um, well, I would be, because I think that there's something about, I would say, I would answer that by saying that, you know, we do make performances, but we never show our performance documentation. Hmm. We don't show it. it all, the documentation, the film, Schindler Glass, is was made for camera. It's not the performance, you know? It may have certain features of this performance, 
but the documentation is not something that we exhibit um and you know aren't don't really have it online because because I think it also is this comes from that belief which is earlier what you kind of triggered me to think Charles was that so much of why we work with performance with bodies in these spaces that idea that you had to be there so we're not interested in kind of like replicating the experience of being there um through its documentation but I think we are interested in how those the, it's almost like this other multiplicity of forms that the performance can generate many things. Yeah. It can generate a film, it can generate a drawing. So to go back to the family pieces, that is a that you could think of that as a diagram of the of the of the performance um or a score of the performance. It's also a pattern. Yeah. You know, there's just an abstract pattern could be read as that. It um these things are paint it's painting mm -hmm. but it's also a piece of sculpture might also just be a piece of furniture mm -hmm. <laughs> and it kind of it also makes the viewer move inside of the exhibition space in a way because it's it hides certain artworks that are behind it and kind of choreographs the spectator through the space so it has almost a functional um uh function yeah. <laughs> and so I think that that hovering in these many different states is very productive for us and kind of like it's a multiplicity that refuses to be one thing and the performative is embedded in it but it's not medium specific to a performance right. if that makes sense yeah. like that's where I would say that we have no faithfulness to the medium of performance yeah. I think I, I actually <laughs> I actually would say totally fully agree with what Brennan is is going here and and this these we we like to think that the site is actually the source whether it's the physical site or more likely the the, the discursive site within it um the set of relations that um once were once sheltered by this particular architecture and then a constellation of works can kind of come from that deep and embodied research um and sometimes those works will even reformat um, like a research we're doing with dancers in a studio might initially format as a performance in situ at the Schindler House and another performance at the Glass House. And then a year later as a film and then ultimately, and I think we probably have an installation view, we design an installation, right, of Schindler Glass. So it which harkens back to our initial research at the site itself um i think that's probably how we think about it you can probably pick up we're kind of resistant to an idea of documentation well uh, documentation is the kind of fixis fixicity uh fixity not fixicity fixity uh rather as opposed to what you're saying is a much more accretive palimpsestic to use a word that uh is very appropriate for your work uh and I see the time if we uh, well, let's just go over slightly before the Q&A to touch on uh, to end with bright hours, but to lead into bright hours, which maybe we'll just uh, use to show the the trailer. I don't know if Chloe, if you could, if you could put that up just to have it ready. Um, but sure. one thing which uh, we've talked about before, and I think it would be really great to uh, enunciate here, maybe at the end is you know, thinking about looking at those screens and you know, as somebody like myself, not necessarily accustomed to being able to read this in terms of, of uh, as a documentation of the performance, but most people wouldn't either, that that there's something that I know that uh, we talked about before of being comfortable with difficult work, comfortable with strangeness, and that is an ethical and moral position that mm. uh, ties into everything we've been talking about in terms of queerness and, and the Enlightenment, but and then we'll lead that into uh, the trailer of, of Bright Hours. But why is it, do you think, so important that we we don't discard difficult work and that we can sit and just not know what something is and however that, uh, well, I, however think, that I, think, I think that's that's where the great pleasure of living is. I mean, I mean, the truth is we none of us know what the hell is going on. <laughs> I mean, none of us know. So. I think abstraction and and 
as yes, what Sontag called difficulty, right? It's the pleasure of living in 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 a in a kind of truthful bearing of witness to the fact that we don't we don't know what it all means, right? And I think we are grappling with history. And I think that's it, because it's not an empty kind of um, let's say expressionistic abstraction, right? It's saying that in order to deal with history, we have to create um, complex and dialectical structures for understanding where we're coming from. Because I do think we can understand where we came from, you know, but I don't know if we can make any divinations about the future. Um, and Bright Hours is very much an attempt to look at a difficult history, the history, the legacy of the architect Le Corbusier. It's the most recent film that we made in the Modern Living series. And like Panorama, it was made for camera. There was never a performance um, on in this site. Um, the detail that we were drawn to, the relational history, was that in the late 20s, Le Corbusier and Josephine Baker had a brief affair on a cruise ship crossing the Atlantic. And so we imagined Le Corbusier's Cité Radieuse in Marseille as that ship. And we have two primary characters, one who is Josephine Baker and the other who is Le Corbusier. Um, although for Le Corbusier, we chose to cast an actress, Jeanne Balibar, to play the role of the architect. Um, and I think that's probably enough to watch the teaser. Well, just before we watch the teaser, just so I think like, we can just end with the teaser, but uh, that I think that the ocean liner serendipitously, again, in terms of the this actual history, uh, is a perfect symbol of this aspect of resisting normative notions of time. It's such a, the, the ship, especially a transatlantic ship, is such a bizarre dislocation and place unto itself that it it functions so well in terms of your uh, everything we've been talking about today in terms of of resisting linearity of resisting fixity of place i mean in the sense of actual movement and that almost an illusion of movement through going through the ocean of of seeming to be in one place with no difference around one and uh, yet moving forward in some in some way and so yeah i think you i mean this it's a it's a completely different film from panorama um, no less propulsive, no less uh, humorous, and uh, but much more. I mean, not uh, to to quote the title, but much brighter in a lot of respects, though, in terms of the <laughs> color. So um, maybe we could watch the trailer uh, now and then open up to Q and A. Le capitaine vous a pas réservé de suite, Miss Baker. Vous brûliez comme le soleil au milieu d'un monde imbécile. Oops. May I could say, Mr. Le Corbusier, who is free in a world like this? I'm free. Il y a une solution mathématique à chaque problème. And what about the problem of race? C'est quoi ta solution? Why don't you wear some color? It bring out your eyes. Well, loath as I am to stop asking you questions myself, I think it's now a good time to open up to the audience to see what they have to say. Wow. Thank you so much to Brennan, to Ryan, and to you, Charles. That was an amazing conversation. Um, we really do have a, a few great questions, so I'll let GE and the audience start us off. GE? Thank you. Just I, I also want to say wow. Thank you. Um, can you can you talk a bit about how rituals probably perhaps accompany each performance, and do any of them ever become built or included into the performances? So like pre-performance rituals, you know, things about building the thing, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. I think that um, there there was a a there was a practice that we um, developed as it was very practical. Um, it was a movement and speaking and memory practice for when we were in these houses 
um, because the space of the house is not like the space of a stage. It's very, it's actually these houses, a lot of the modernist houses where we've worked are very small. Um, <laughs> they're not like what you see in a photograph. So in order to be able to dance in these houses, to move in these houses, we developed a score, which is called the clock. And I would say it's a kind of ritual. And the clock is a choreographic score in which each dancer or performer um, has to find a movement that corresponds to the numbers on the face of a clock with 12 being in front of you, six behind you, and there's three and there's nine. And so it is a, it also acknowledges that in these houses in these spaces of architecture, there is no front. So unlike in a film or a stage performance, the space is 3D. So it also includes the space behind you. And this, this score, which generated the choreography of the movement became a kind of practice for us of how to move and embody ourselves and our relations within space. And I think that we had, we created that ritual as a way of, of making the work inside of these spaces. Absolutely. Thank you so very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for that question, GE. And thank you for that answer, Brennan and Ryan. Um, the next question is gonna be from Lynn Crawford. Lynn, I'll allow you to unmute now to ask directly. Thank you so much. This was fascinating and um, overwhelmingly so, actually. And what struck me each with each um, project you uh, showed us is that you refuted very powerful structures and systems with a series of very specific languages that had nothing to do with the language employed by the power structures. Hmm. I don't know if it, I don't know if I'm right or not, but it, it, I mean, the your language was not their language hmm. and it was brilliant and it was so subversive and powerful. And I'm just wondering if you really do spend time each with each project, like an enemy mapping out the camp that you're, <laughs> you know, finding a language anyway. Thank you. But yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, no, totally. I think that um, we didn't see a lot of them on, but there are other sketches and drawings that um, are in the Neem show that we 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 kind of make them before in our notebooks and whatnot, and as part of the the um, mapping out, let's say part of the process and then we'll remake them which is kind of how the screens came together and to use the designs later on to make the artworks but um the way we usually do it is we use the um architectural plan of the building that we're working on and really study that so we we are actually studying it in a way that similar to how the architect might have but then what we're using it for is that's our that's the footprint in which we're thinking about how bodies are going to move and how people are going to interact. And also in the case of performance, how a public is going to move through the site. So it is a different language than the language of building construction. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that to challenge those, um, the power structures that are often embedded in those architectures, you do have to sing and dance and, and chant and rap at them because mm. if you try to meet them on their terms, they will overpower. Yeah. But I think we we have actually, it's that David and Goliath thing. All you need is a yeah. slingshot. Mm. You just yeah. have to know where to hit it. It's beautifully subversive. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I will I will fall asleep with that one tonight. Beautifully <laughs> subversive. I like that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lynn, for that question. The next question is going to be from my colleague Carolyn. And if anybody else has a question, feel free to raise your hand and we'll go to you next. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um I'm really thinking about this line. Um, one of you said the erotics of living with the ruin and um, in light of, I mean, mark making kind of alongside this, like describing an absence or like time kind of in history, like 
as your as your material. And um, I wonder if you could talk more about the erotics part of this. Like, is it, um, you know, I'm guessing it's not quite longing for anything that isn't there, but maybe um, maybe the erotics is more in refusal um, of what is there. Um, if, if either of you both could expand. It's a really good question. I would say that as I'm, as a kind of like, it's very interesting question as I, as I start, as trying to answer it, I would say that one of the things that is definitely true is that the, the, the ruins that we may choose to study or build a project off of, they have a certain kind of attraction to us and we invest in these ruins. And you might call that an erotic investment or a sublimated erotic investment in these, ob the objects that we are studying, we're intervening in, we are um, interrogating, um, that we're really dealing with. So there's definitely a kind of circulate, circulation around the object that feels um, that there's something more than just an, an intellectual investment. Oh, yeah. It's not just intellectual. Um, it's really like a kind of experience that we've had that has shaken us or shattered us that then drives us and I think that's how it relates to erotics, as I would say, as the erotics is the ground of that which shakes you or shatters you. Yeah, there's there have <laughs> been many, um, there have been several architectures that we have visited or been invited to consider working with that we have not chosen to work with because it didn't feel that it would give us that charge or we didn't find that fragment of history that would... Um, kind of generate, be generative. I think that the erotic relationship to the critical object uh, layered with the erotics of the collaboration, because you have to have this when you're working collaboratively and you're working with performers, sometimes across projects, um, you start to develop a kind of relationship which is extremely intimate, you know? So you, I mean, you can't hate your performers. It doesn't work. <laughs> and then, and then every director will tell you that they're in love with their rushes. You know, they're in love with their with their footage. So, I think that yes, this saves it from becoming an into a uh, kind of flat intellectual project, or frankly, like why in why it's not just an essay. You know, although really good writing is pretty erotic too. It's true. Um. But I think maybe that idea that like built in any kind of erotic relationship, think about your best loves, is a kind of love hate, mm. right? And that kind of push pull with the critical object is really productive. Um, if you ever get a chance to see the Schindler Glass um, film and and installation, I think you'll see like our particularly our relationship to the glass house site was extremely like it was End a it was a tor torrid affair mm -hmm. i mean you know um the attraction to this house as a kind of haven for for queer people and for gay men particularly um in the post stonewall pre stonewall and post stonewall period but at the same time, a place just haunt it with um, fascism, with fascism, right. and 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 really, we couldn't get away from it. Very troubled past, and I think that's like you know that's like that bad affair. That's like you can't stay away from it, but at the same time, you know you shouldn't be there. But also, I would say just also the insist like even when we're doing this work of the archaeological work or the deconstructive work or the so-called critical work, um, that you can't separate pleasure out of that work. I think it's also about claiming the pleasure, either in the writing or the working with people or the dancing or the drawing or the designing the installation to insist upon the pleasure inside of that work and continuing to make space for that as, as another way of learning. So cool. Thank you. Thank you so much for that amazing question, Carolyn. And thank you for those answers. The last question today will be from me. Um, I am wondering about 
how your works have often been described as blurring the line between fact and fiction. And when I think about the process of architectural restoration and preservation, there's also this dance between fact and fiction there. And there's like these resulting pilgrimages to these places and spaces and um, the all the very detail-oriented translation that went into what you see when you go and visit. And I wonder how you think about restoration or preservation um, after making your works or during making your works? I mean, we we have sometimes thought about the works as having a kind of um, preservation activity, but I'd say in the sense that we are particularly when we were working in when we're working in the domestic spaces that by returning um, the body and relationships and and a kind of activity of living to those spaces, we are preserving their function as a home. Hmm. And these are houses, these are architectures that have long abandoned being shelters for living and they've become museums or monuments. And we're about to return to a home, again, a house, which we will try to make a home for um, the next film that we're shooting this spring at the Eileen Gray um, Villa E1027. So I think that aspect is, there is a preservationist um, um, tilt mm -hmm. to the work in that particular way. Yeah, and I would say that like there's a, um, I think that the, there's a, a way that we're starting to understand maybe that we are really interested in like speculative fiction. So after the question of, which is really important always with any art project, I think to ask like, what is it? What What is this thing? And really engage with the question, accepting it, describing it, encountering it on its terms, not just your reading of it or your interpretation of a thing, but what is it? But then the next question I think that comes out of after that is like, what if? So I think we start with what is it, and then we get to what if, and then that leads to what we might the call fiction, the speculation, yeah. the imagination. Amazing. Thank you both so much for those answers. And thank you again for today's conversation um, to both of you, as well as to Charles. It was really, really incredible to hear you speak so generously about both of the exhibitions that are on view. And I hope those joining us today get to see um, one of the shows. Um, there's a show panorama on at Marion Goodman, um, and then as well, uh, Ruin on at Caridar in Nimes through the end of March. Um, at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Violet Spurlock. Poet Violet Spurlock is the author of Alloyed Bliss, and Verses, Verses, Verses. She is the winner of the 2021 Future Poem Other Futures Award for her full-length collection in lieu of solutions. In addition to writing poetry, she facilitates a writing group for trans authors and is currently at work on a novel. Um, so if you could join me in welcoming Violet. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to everyone at The Rail. Um, for the invitation. And thank you so much, Ryan and Brennan. That was really such a fascinating talk. And primarily I'm a writer, but secretly I'm very passionate about dance and movement. And um, it's just such a delight to hear you talk about it in relation to history, architecture, relational forms. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to read the first poem from In Lieu of Solutions, which is titled Epidermal Ripple Pools. We debate about my tiny titties. You think they are getting bigger. I think they are getting smaller. Predictable. You say that I don't see myself from the side. See, that's an argument. You may offer me sensory details about how you view my profile, but I process it as evidence 
against my perspective for which I am grateful. You tell me a fairy tale. A man wins and loses the love of a fairy. A range of voice, voices, images, explanations. The central object is bread. The central action is violence. We don't have to go too deep into analysis because the surface is so rich. I smile because I'm noting our difference and it is so beautiful. Your story is completely compelling, generous in delivering pleasure, enough for anyone to fall in love. I write a story which is really a record of my own belief. My friend says it leaves the reader little to chew. The thoughts are so highly processed that sensory details and experiences have already been refined into conclusions. I offer that it is apt for the writing to appear more as essay than as narrative because I often live my life more as essay than as narrative. My friend says, well, I wasn't gonna say it. My story is a lonely meditation, mirroring the paucity of the reader's life, a salve for the heart sick. You say you can't write in the form of a project. I say I can't write good descriptions. We like each other's writing. I read a friend's book and it contains images. The images are clearly allegorical and I discern from the passages featuring direct argument and from my conversations with the friend, that the images refer to ideas I am interested in expressing, compelled to express. I like my mode of expressing ideas and I like their mode of expressing images. An imagined collaboration emerges as a solution. I think if only someone could offer me images, ready-made please, ethically sourced if possible, I know you think that the world is full of images, that inspiration is waiting outside my window, and you're right, but you're wrong. An image is a highly processed abstraction. Its function is to forget, help you forget about abstraction. How is it made? We are forbidden to say. In this poem, I'm avoiding the use of images. Are my titties an image? perhaps for you. And am I forced to follow my logic here, to admit that my titties are, to me, an argument, an idea, a concept? Perhaps. My titties certainly have a spectral existence. If I describe them to you, I am both extending and negating the imagined space that they fill. My titties are under consideration now. If my titties develop further, it will be due to what we call conscious choice. This fact, which cannot be perceived by assessing the physical qualities of titties, would seem to give my developed titties a sort of special status, chosen titties. Would we mystify this fact by describing the titties? I began by thinking about the words that I needed but could not give myself. One of those words was titties. If this word denotes an image and this image is supposed to emanate from my body, then my body to be described thusly has a responsibility to correspond to the word which describes it. That is why the word, if it is an image, is used. This is the conditionality of description. This is what I cannot bear. This is the only way I exist. I recall asking a friend about her sex life. She said, well, my pussy doesn't quite get hard these days. It is important that we extrapolate no fact about her body from this word. It is inevitable that we will extrapolate. If you love description, you probably will extrapolate images. Hopefully, you know how to do so lovingly, generously. I love my friend's pussy because it sang to me of a hidden power. I am not talking about my friend's body. We spoke on the phone. 
I love my friend's pussy because a word was made different in response to a need. The word pussy fit as naturally into the sentence as any other. The sentence described a change in the quality of an entity over time. The sentence reformulated the shape of an image. But the sentence saved me because it articulated a form of life, a life in which the words we use are the words we need. I love my friend's pussy because I cannot speak its name without getting free. Thank you. Wow, Violet, that was um, just absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for your reading today. And thank you again to Brennan and Ryan and to Charles. And a huge thank you as well to Jonathan, Sylvia, Linda, and the team at Marion Goodman Gallery who helped us prepare for today's event. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation who sponsor our NSC program and make daily conversations like this one possible and for their support of our growing archive. You can view today's event and our full archive on the Rails YouTube channel. For 22 years, the Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events like here on our daily NSC. This holiday season, help us sustain our work and reach our goal of raising $150,000 towards the Rails writers, editors, and operations. Your support will keep our issues and events free. You can donate via the link in the chat. And if you're free tomorrow at 1 p.m., join us for a conversation with Yunfei Ji and Lily Wei on the event of The Sunflower Turned Its Back at James Cohan Gallery. You can now turn on your microphone and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. so much. Thanks, Violet. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Gerard and Kelly. Great program. Thank, Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Great poem, Violet. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you for the reading, Violet. <laughs>